Thank you all for joining us here today. Today you will hear from three really incredible people who have worked uh, in the space of speaking about The Voice, but before The Voice existed, have done a, a whole lot of stuff as far as um, uh, contributing to the work. Like the, they've done a whole range of different uh, types of work and research um, in, the, in their respective areas, and you'll hear a little bit more about them a little bit in a second. But before I do, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all gathered here today, the Yagara and the Turrbal people. Um, and I also would like to um, pay respects to all elders um, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are present here in this room for this discussion today. <coughs> I'm your facilitator, Karina Hogan, and I'm a proud Aboriginal and South Sea Islander woman with strong ancestral ties to northern New South Wales, Bundjalung country. I grew up and I live on Yugen Bear country, which is about 27 kilometres south of so-called Brisbane or Mugganjan, Mianjin. Um, and I am a producer and broadcaster with the ABC, uh, which is just across the river. And I've been working with them on and off for almost 15 years. Uh, I also sit on the board of the Children's Hospital Queensland, Brisbane, uh, the Brisbane Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Health Service, Deadly Coders, and I am the chair of a national organisation called Black Dance. I'm also a single mum uh, to two and an auntie to many. Um, I just need to preface this discussion by saying that uh, me being here and presenting this um, does not uh, indicate m where my vote will be going. Um, so uh, just as a declaration, particularly because I work over at the ABC. Um, so before I introduce the panellists, I'd like to thank the Centre for Behavioural Economic Society and Technology who made this happen um, and uh, contributed to uh, bringing this event together. I'd also like to acknowledge the Centre for Justice who are also supporting this event. Uh, Glenda Tenner and Amy for your support. Uh, we really very much appreciate it and we are joined here today um, by Angela Barney Leach who is the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor um, here at QUT for Indigenous Australians. Um, I'm looking forward to a really uh, robust conversation today and I just want to acknowledge that there are people who have joined us online uh, for this discussion and I encourage everyone to think about questions that they may have or comments for the uh, end that will um, you know, bring out some of the, the amazing knowledge that we've got right sitting right here next to me. Um, and they do, each of them. So please don't be afraid to stand up and ask questions. Um, there's no silly question. Um, and, and I look forward to that. But first, uh, Shireen Morris. Sh Shireen uh, researches, teaches and publishes in constitutional law and constitutional reform, Indigenous constitutional recognition, as well as public law more gener generally, specialising in the concept of a First Nations constitutional voice. She completed her PhD at Monash University with a thesis on Indigenous constitutional recognition through a First Nations constitutional voice and is the director of the Radical Centre Law uh, Re Re Reform Lab at Macquarie University Law School. Selwyn Button is an experienced senior executive who has led large health education and governance organisations across the government, private and not-for-profit sectors. Currently, Selwyn is a partner of PwC Australia and PwC Indigenous Consulting, chairperson of Lewitcher Institute and a committed member of numerous boards, including the Australian Children's Education and Care Quality Authority, the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health and Queensland Rugby. A Goongaroo man from southwest Queensland, Selwyn has, was raised in Sherberg and for many years has led policy, service delivery and legislative reforms to support improved outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. He's also served as an Assistant Director General for Indigenous Education in Queensland and CEO of the Queensland Aboriginal and Islander Council. Uh, I'm uh, fortunate enough to work with someone in some of those, uh, those areas, so thank you for being here. Erin on the end here is a proud Bundjalung woman. Erin Lang has worked in Aboriginal communities for over 10 years, building respect, gaining trust and demonstrating fairness and sincerity all along the way. That brings energy and enthusiasm to Reconciliation Queensland, where she plans to continue building, building and maintaining strong relationships at all levels of the community to achieve the organisation's vision of an equitable and informed Queensland. Please join me in welcoming our three panellists. 
We really want to dig straight in uh, because there's a lot that we want to cover. And I'm going to start with Shireen. Um, Shireen, let's set the scene here a little bit. For people that don't know um, and who aren't too sure about what it means, what is the Australian Constitution and what is the difference between the Constitution and legislation? Yeah, excellent. So the Constitution is Australia's highest legal rule book and it's the document that basically governs how Australia is run. So in the 1800s, when the representatives of the colonies, they were getting together to decide how they were going to unite to create this new nation, Australia, um, after a decade of negotiations about all the rules and processes that would govern our country, the constitution was established in 1901. So that's the, the rule book of Australia. Um, but the problem with the constitution is that there was not a single Indigenous representative included in those discussions, even though Indigenous people had lived here for over 65,000 years, right? So the constitution that came into force in 1901 contained clauses explicitly excluding Indigenous people. And um, when you were listening to the Uluru statement then, you would have heard the words torment of powerlessness, you know, talks about the torment of powerlessness that Indigenous people have experienced. In my view, that powerlessness has its source in the Australian Constitution. Um, constitutional lawyers, we, we call the Constitution a power sharing compact because it's the document that distributes legal and political power in our country and sets in place rules and processes for how that power is exercised. But for Indigenous people who are excluded from that power sharing deal, it sets up this position of powerlessness and it creates this really top down power dynamic with Indigenous Australians. Um, and you can see how that's played out in the history because there have been decades and decades of laws and policies that have treated Indigenous people really unfairly and discriminated against them, made under the constitution and allowed by the constitution. Laws denying them the vote in some jurisdictions right up until the 60s. And actually, perfect equality in voting rights wasn't achieved until something like 1983 because it wasn't um, compulsory for Indigenous people to vote before then. Policies denying them the payment of equal wages for their hard work. Sometimes no wages, have some rations instead. Um, policies controlling where they could live, who they could marry. Sometimes banning their languages from being spoken. All of that flows from the Constitution, right? All of that was enabled and allowed by the Constitution. And even today, although most of that harsh discrimination is in the past, this top-down power dynamic is still in play. Because if you read the Productivity Commission's report into Closing the Gap a few weeks ago, the Productivity Commission said Australia's failing to close the gap. Why? Because everything is top-down because policy makers and politicians in Canberra don't listen to Indigenous communities when making laws and policies about them. Um, and that has its roots in the constitutional power dynamic as well. So when we're talking about setting the scene, I would love for you to give um, an idea of where the voice started, the concept of it, and how it kind of evolved to where it is now. Yeah, so because of that power dynamic and because of that history of unfair treatment under the constitution, Indigenous advocates for decades and decades and decades have asked for substantive constitutional recognition to create a more fair power relationship. Um, they've never asked for merely symbolic recognition, by the way, never, not once. Um, but since William Cooper in 1937, he petitioned the British King asking for a voice in Parliament and the Yolngu Bark petitions in the 1960s, they asked for fairer consultation when government makes decisions about them and their land. And then in 1988, the Barunga Statement, the Yolngu people up in the Northern Territory gave that to Bob Hawke, Prime Minister Bob Hawke at the time. That asked for a national Indigenous body to give them a voice. So this has been a recurring, recurring theme. Now, after the Barunga Statement, um, ATSIC, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, was created, but only in legislation, right? It wasn't underpinned by that constitutional guarantee that would give a body permanence. So that's why the Uluru Statement is asking for a constitutionally guaranteed voice to create that guarantee that Indigenous people will always have a voice and will always be heard in laws and policies made about them. Now, um, 
how then did it, why is it that then that a referendum is only happening now? So explain to me or, or to us what a referendum is um, and, and, and how that plays out. So yeah, it's a very good point. The constitution can only be changed by a double majority referendum. Unlike ordinary legislation, which can be changed just through going through ordinary parliamentary processes, the constitution needs a double majority referendum. That means a vote of the Australian people, where a majority of voters nationally have to vote yes, but also four out of six states need to vote yes. Right, so that's a very high threshold and only eight out of 44 referendums have succeeded. Um, and in addition to that, you need a government, a parliament that's willing to put a referendum to the Australian people. So that kind of answers your question as to why now, right? Well, now, because we've got a government that's willing to put the referendum question to the Australian people. The previous government that was in for nine years didn't um, want to initiate that referendum. So there that need to be crossed. You need a government willing to put the vote to the Australian people, you need a majority of voters nationally and you need four out of six states to vote yes. I'm going to get to Selwyn and Erin. Can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. <laughs> I know the answer but I want Shireen to tell the audience. How many countries, how many country, Commonwealth countries around the world require a referendum to change their constitution? It's a really good question. I don't actually is know it, the number. <laughs> is, it a, is it a normal thing or is Australia not the norm where there's a small minority of countries around the world that require a referendum to change their constitution. Do you know the answer to this? I don't know the actual, num <laughs> I don't know the actual number, but I do I know that it is uncommon. Yeah, it's not that common. Um, it's, I mean, for example, New Zealand doesn't have an entrenched constitution at all, right? All of New Zealand's small c constitutional arrangements are in ordinary legislation, which makes their structural arrangements very easy to change but countries like Canada and the US they have more locked in constitutions um, but I don't necessarily know whether they require um, a full referendum sometimes they just require higher majorities in in the legislature to change them um, but some countries do require referendums as well yeah. but it's a particularly rigorous uh, thing here in Australia and one could assume that if they've done that in 1901 They've done it for the purposes of not wanting to change it very often. And at that time, they were locking people out of it, so they didn't want to let those people in it. Mm. Things have changed a little bit since 1901. Um, so I'm going to get to Erin and Selwyn very shortly, but just because I want to set the scene here so that we have a, an understanding of the real basics, but explaining the constitution, can you um, take a minute just to explain the constitutional wording and and um, uh, what it is exactly that we are all um, being tasked with voting yes. for. So can we put the wording up on the um, slide? But also, there it is there, and you've also got those little business cards on your seat. So this is what we're actually voting on in this referendum, right? Um, only this. This is the yes-no question. Are we saying yes to recognising Indigenous people in the Constitution by giving them a voice in their affairs? a voice in laws and policies made about them. So you'll see the first line there says, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. That's why we're having this conversation. Because as I explained, Indigenous people were explicitly excluded from the constitution of 1901. This is about including them, recognising them, moving from exclusion to inclusion and recognition. This is the whole reason we're having this conversation. But they're asking to be recognised in a practical way right, in a way that's going to make a difference to their lives and their communities. So section one says, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. So that's the guarantee. Like, remember I was talking about saying Indigenous people are seeking a guarantee that there will always be a voice, that they'll always have a say in laws and policies made about them. Clause one there, that's the guarantee. So if we vote yes, that's all of us Australians making a promise a commitment that Indigenous people are always going to have a voice, they're always going to be heard in laws and policies made about them. That's the guarantee. So Clause 2 says what the job of this body will be. And it says the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So may make representations. That just means they can give advice. Right? This is an advisory body. 
And the word representations is actually a more modest word than advice, legally speaking, because it makes doubly, triply sure that it's non-binding. There's no expectation that the advice needs to be followed, right? So this is it. And it's not compulsory representations, just may make representations, the ability to, to give advice um, on matters relating to Indigenous peoples. And section three is really important because it says the parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures, right? So that answers the detail question. So when people ask you, where's the detail of this voice? Who's hiding the detail? Why haven't we seen the detail? Show them this amendment that we're voting on. And clause three says it's parliament's job to legislate the detail, right? So if we vote yes, if we say yes, we want Indigenous people to be recognised in the constitution through having a voice, then if we say yes, it's parliament's job to legislate how this voice will look, how it will operate, etc. And legislation is more flexible than the constitution. So future parliaments could change the legislation, could create a different looking voice that might operate slightly differently. And importantly, it's not government, it's parliament. So it's not up to Anthony Albanese how the voice looks and how it operates. It's up to Parliament. Labor, Liberal, the Greens, the Teals, One Nation, they all get a say. If we vote yes, they will all get a say in how this voice looks, how it operates, and future Parliaments will be able to change that. So this is what we're voting on in this referendum. I just want to remind everyone um, that we have three incredible um, speakers here today. So please, if you've got questions, if you've got comments, things that you'd like to weigh in on, please, and that includes everyone that's online, please um, get them ready. So, and I want to move to you. <clears throat> so you spoke about practical matters, um, Shireen, but you've worked heavily in the health space. You do work um, in, in sport, uh, right across the board. You're an active uh, Indigenous community member. What practical measures will come out of The Voice if it is passed? It's a good question. Thanks, Karina. Um, if I can give a really specific example, one of the best examples, and this is very, very common and, and is something that sits in our backyard, because quite often many of the, lots of the conversations that people ask about in relation to practical applications of voice, we do see lots of examples where it's about things that are going on in remote communities. So I'm going to give an example about something that's sitting in downtown Brisbane because it's actually how the voice can work in an urban area. And there's this thing that Karina knows about um, that was started at Brisbane Oaks many years ago. It's sitting in a clinic in Salisbury and it's called Bioc, Birthing in Our Community. And it's, it's essentially a mums and bubs program that is run by the local community control health services that, it, that focus on ensuring that young mums are attending antenatal visits, are participating in everything that's necessary to ensure that they have safe births. Now, this has now been going on for about 10 years. I think Bioc's been running. My son turns 10 in February and he went through the program. And my, He was a second child. And my granddaughter, who's five, was also comes through the Bioc program. And the reason why I talk about that is because what it is is that the community in South East Queensland through the Aboriginal Medical Services got together and said birthing that's happening in many of the major hospitals around the place isn't providing for the needs of our mothers and our families. So we need to do something different. And so the services got together and started to run their own clinics. And importantly, these clinics are run and led by Aboriginal women. It's not it's, it's, in, when we first started, we had to bring in uh, midwives and others to provide that expertise. But over time, we've built up and trained local staff, Aboriginal women, Torres Strait Islander women, to be a part of the process in Bioc, sitting in that clinic in Salisbury. And as Karina alluded to, we've had numbers and numbers, and numbers of family come through that centre now, where the data and the evidence from this particular program is showing that the preterm birth weights for Indigenous babies through Bioc is better than non-Indigenous preterm birth weights. So it's actually outperforming non-Indigenous maternity services in downtown Brisbane, and this is run by the community. Now, the reason why I mention that as an example, this is an example that sits here. This is an example that 
that is then attempting to be replicated across the country. The reason that we talk about that one in terms of the connection to the voice is that you've got a local story here of success that's actually about supporting young mums and families to ensure that kids get the best start and the healthiest start in life. How do you then scale that up at the moment, scaling up a conversation to say, let's take that example and work out what it looks like in Sydney. Let's work out what it looks like in Perth. Let's look, look, work out what it looks like in Adelaide. At the moment, we can't do that. And that's the whole notion of the voice. Whilst we're talking about establishing a national voice through our national constitution, the voice itself can only be benefit and can only work if we're capturing these local stories to feed into the voice. So the voice then actually provides advice at a national level on policy and legislation based on these local stories where we've got pockets of success that we can actually feed up to the voice to, to start to amplify those local stories and the good stuff that's happening. Is it? There have been attempts to scale it. So just let me, um, there was a question from the audience, an impromptu question, just so that it's on the mic. But why can't that be scaled up now, was the question. And, and there have been attempts to scale it up. And we are seeing some of those things started. But again, what it, what it is structurally, there's impediments that exist both at a state level and at a national level in the sense of saying, what does this then look like and to, to replicate those sorts of things. So what we've done here in South East Queensland is gone outside some of the rules, essentially, and started those conversations outside of what government are saying we can and can't do. So this wasn't asking for permission, and we did it because it was a, it was a need and we saw the identified need in community. We, did, we didn't do it because government gave us permission to do it. We did it because the community said that this was the best way that we think we're going to support young mums and young, young babies. Now, if you, if you take that conversation to a national level, um, there are going to be impediments and regulations along the way. So it's actually now about saying, well, how do we, re how do we reduce the red tape? How do we cut down those impediments? How do we re remove those barriers for that stuff to happen at a national level? At the moment, having that conversation isn't working because there are different regulations in different states and territories. But the use of it, as I said, use of a national voice to amplify those local stories will make things, start to make things much easier for us. And if you'd like to read a little bit about the birthing in our community, you can do so by going to Google and simply typing in the Lancet Review um, and typing in BIOC. Um, that was, I, we didn't even know that that was going to happen, but um, that was a perfect example, um, Selwyn. Um, and for you, Erin, this is something that you've been pushing for quite a while. Um, you're very much at the forefront of this um, campaign through Reconciliation um, Queensland. So what does a voice mean to you and how will it make a practical difference for you? Um, okay, so my, my work background, just to give everybody a little bit of insight, I've worked in a lot of community organisations. So after I left high school, I took off and started moving around the country. I've worked in alcohol and substance misuse. I've done homelessness. I worked at a diversionary centre. Um, I've done f like ch working with children and family domestic violence. And I guess then I've done native title and then now I'm in reconciliation. And I think the part that brings me here, I guess, is jumping around into all those different kind of community organisations. You come across this system where you can only work within this, this field or this barrier before you are met with some sort of requirement that, you know, the government's trying to meet or um, restrictions and rules that are set there. So you kind of hit this ceiling and you just get stuck there and then you see this cycle so in the four years i was in cairns working at the diversionary center up there i spent it was actually quite frustrating you spend every day going into work trying to get people into the, like this process of going to like you know rehabs and then you know other clinics to see within six months those people are back and it's because there's there's these systems that don't get supported by systems and there's a youth group in cairns at the moment called Dig. it's deadly inspiring youth doing good even now, they've got families that want to work with them and they, you know, to help them stop getting their, you know, their children being removed from them. But they can't work with the families that want their help because there is some sort of government procurement policy that's not letting Dig do the work that they need to do. So these systems and these processes and policies that get written in that bureaucratic level of the government, some of those people who decide how those policies are written and what they look like, 
we've still got people, what was the stat I read recently? Someone was telling me one in three people are saying they still haven't met an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person in Australia. That's what they, that's, that's actually a stat that people think is, is real. And I guess that probably talks to some, un, you know, unconscious bias and stereotypes because they probably expect all of us to live in Arnhem Land or somewhere like that. But these people, who potentially think that they've never met an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people, like person, is then in charge of writing policy and they're then in charge of implementing policy. So by the time you get to a community organisation program, it's already heavily dictated by some sort of policy or some sort of something that's, you know, they've got milestones and objectives they've got to meet. But it's been written by somebody who has no idea what happens in community. They have no idea that some communities out there can only use water at certain times of the day. They have no idea that there's, you know, go to the Torres Straits and see how much Milo and Tim Tams are. Like there's these sort of policies that people are writing don't know those things. They don't understand those experiences. They don't know the that big gap that there's, it's, because a lot of people keep saying, you know, why do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people get something different? Like why are we asking for special treatment? We're not asking for special treatment. We're asking for some sort of like bridge to help us change this big gap that's there like I'm pretty sure if people had to pay for Tim Tams in the Torres Straits very often they'd understand the freaking gap but anyway <laughs> um, history Australia tends to forget history fairly easy um, and in a panel discussion the other day one of the panelists mentioned um, how the 1967 referendum for her is just a concept because she was born after it right um, and quite often I'll speak to my nieces um, who are so incredibly intelligent, but they kind of don't know and don't understand the work that we had to do in order to get to where we are now. Um, you guys are all clearly yes voters. So how is it that, especially given that we as Aboriginal and uh, as First Nations people have such a young population, 33% of us are under 16 compared to 18% for non-Indigenous Australians, but just even more broadly, right across the board to young people, how, how do you get the message across to younger people about the importance of this vote? So, and I might start with, start with you. Give it a bit of a historical <laughs> context, I think, too, would be great. Thanks. Um, and look, if we think about history, and particularly the history of Queensland itself, growing up in an Aboriginal community, um, which is about three and a half hours northwest of here, which was this, one of the former Aboriginal missions that was was um, created in the early 1900s, around the same time as the, the Constitution was written. Like there's some of those things that, um, that both Karina and Shireen have talked about were played out in my home community. Um, so things like loss of language, loss of culture. My own grandfather was a Gungri speaker. I didn't find out he was a Gungri speaker until after he passed away and, an, and other old men at his funeral and through, as I was growing up were telling me that they used to actually speak. He was the one that would keep Gungri speaking going in the in the local community but then once he passed it was gone he never shared that with my brother and i um we didn't we didn't get the opportunity because legislation of the day did didn't allow him to practice his language and culture even though he knew his language and culture he couldn't practice it um so we miss out on that because of because of those things fast forward to, to i guess then looking at even some simple things in there Sherberg, as, an, as a community, only got its own self-determination and, and autonomy in the early 80, 80s, 1980s. So we're not talking about a long time ago. Um, when I was born, funnily enough, one of the best pieces of legislative change that I think has benefited Aboriginal people in Queensland was in the, in the late 70s, um, because one of the first things that the Queensland government did when they first took back many, control of many of the Aboriginal communities from the Department of Aboriginal Affairs was to was to look at increasing the numbers of students going to school. So what they started was, well, what we now call kindy, was pre-prep back then. And so they started that in Aboriginal communities across the state. The education department did when they took control of running education because they didn't have it before that. They then enabled young Aboriginal kids to then go to school at three and a half years old. So I was the beneficiary of lists of changes because I got to go to pre-prep at three and a half years old in Sherbrooke. And so I got to engage in school early, I got to like school, I got to keep going back. So it's these sorts of things where we've seen some positive change, but then hasn't translated over a long period of time. Mm. Andrew and I were in the education department together 
when we achieved some fairly significant results with year 12 out for year 12 outcomes for Indigenous kids, where over a couple of years we essentially closed the gap in education performance for year 12 Indigenous students. The reason why we did that and the reason why we were able to achieve that is because we changed the system to, ha to make sure that they were having conversations with students and their parents. So it's not like things can't shift. Edu systems can shift. It's about how do you shift systems and then look at the sustainability of those outcomes and make sure that you can scale it up and to have essentially a, this national voice and this national structure that ensures that you can do these sorts of things. Because the simple thing we talked to, to principals back in 2016 was about understanding the needs of students, understanding the needs of families and what was going on in the family circumstance and how do you support their aspirations to achieve an outcome is giving them a voice. That's all we did. And I suppose now when we look at outcomes, um, it, it, it would be fair to say that those outcomes for First Nations people remain pretty dire. Um, for example, 38% uh, of the female prison population is... Uh, uh, the female prison population um, are Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. Um, we are still 27 times more likely Aboriginal women to present at an emergency department for a violent-related injury. We are... In the Northern Territory, more, territory, you're more likely to go to prison than you are to go to university. So these things still exist. Despite that, we are a very strong and resilient community. We do amazing things as a community and there, are, there is a lot of love and togetherness within and, our communities. And there is a direct correlation, and this is some of the, the data we've pulled together over the last few years about educational outcomes, and there's an absolute direct correlation with attendance rates and youth detention. So where you see a reduction in attendance rates across states and territories, you see a spike in youth detention. So what we're actually seeing is that the shift is away from spending more in the education sector to make sure that kids are staying in school and the spend then shifts across to youth detention. So you're spending money on incarceration and the spike in incarceration continues to rise as opposed to the, the, the money over here where it's reducing because the kids aren't going to school as opposed to saying, well, how do we keep them there in the first place? I'm about to go to questions in about four or five minutes. But, Shireen, I wanted to talk to you about the multicultural communities because um, if uh, you guys want the yes vote to get up, the multicultural communities are crucial to this. Can you speak to that and tell me why that is and what is required um, if you would like to see the voice get up? I think it's absolutely crucial um, and we've seen in some previous elections how important the multicultural vote is in swaying outcomes. I actually think um, the vote of multicultural communities could be the difference between yes or no in this um, national referendum. Um, if you go to multiculturalforvoice.org, you'll see that I think it's over 180 ethnic and cultural community organisations have signed up to support this and there's um, multicultural ambassadors signing up to um, disseminate accurate information in their communities. At the same time, the No case is targeting migrant communities with some really bad um, misinformation, saying things like, oh, if you vote yes, Aboriginal people are going to come and take your house, um, be able to take your land, stuff like that. Those kinds of messages are being targeted at migrant communities, so it is very, very important that um, multicultural communities get access to good information. But just um, on the history thing and, and kind of what to, maybe what to say to multicultural young people, you know, um, I reflect sometimes on the, the fact that, so my pa I'm Indian and Fijian Indian background and my parents migrated here in the 70s towards the end of the white Australia policy. And they came from um, poor backgrounds but they got scholarships to come here and study down in Melbourne. And because they were given that opportunity to come to this country, I was born in Melbourne and I've grown up with such immense privilege and opportunity compared to what they had, right? And that's why I love Australia and why I'm sure many migrants um, and descendants of migrants love Australia because it's given us this opportunity. But I've also come to understand the history and the fact that Indigenous Australians have not had access to the same opportunity. Acknowledging the fact that migrants too have struggled and we too have experienced discrimination sometimes. And I'll give you two examples. Um, 
when um, uh, I was doing research for my PhD, I came across this story of an Indian man, Mita Bulosh, down in Victoria. And, you know, because back at that time, this is in the 1920s, it wasn't only Indigenous people who weren't allowed to vote. Lots of other non-white people weren't allowed to vote, like Pacific Islanders, Indians, Maoris, etc. And this Indian man, Mita Bulosh, he went to court and challenged his exclusion from voting under the Commonwealth law. This is in the 20s. And the government subsequently changed the law to allow Indian people the right to vote in Australia. But Indigenous people didn't get the right to vote until about four decades later. And that kind of makes me think, you know, if only that Indian guy had stood in solidarity with his Indigenous counterparts, maybe justice across the board could have been achieved so much earlier. Um, second example I'll give you is that when my parents came to this country, they could go house hunting in Melbourne. And back when property prices were so much lower and they could buy a house to build their wealth and to pass on that wealth to me and my brother. Now, when I went up to Cairns to work at Cape York Institute with the Aboriginal leader, Noel Pearson, I learned that the WIC people up in Aracoon, around the same time my parents were house hunting and buying a house, they were prevented from buying back their own traditional land that they had lived on for thousands of years because there was a Queensland government policy that prevented Aboriginal people from purchasing large tracts of land. So the WIC people went off to court and challenged that policy um, and it was struck down under the Racial Discrimination Act. But do you know what the Premier, Joe Bielke-Peterson, did? He turned the land into a national park so that no one could buy it. Now you go to Aracoon now and look at the level of sheer disadvantage still being suffered there. Um, those people have very little. There's a reason why people like me, Indian Australians in this country, are prospering compared to the Indigenous Australians in this country. Even though we've struggled and even though, you know, we've at times also experienced discrimination. And I think young people, um, like you said, might not know some of that history, but when they hear it, you know, the empathy is there. And when migrants hear these, the, the history, the comparative history there, the empathy is there. And this, this vote, it's such a small thing, us writing yes in a box, you know, but it might be our only chance to actually give back to them who've lost so much um, in Australia's history so that this great democracy could be built. And we've all benefited from this democracy, um, but they've lost out. And this might be our only chance to give back to them. If I can, on the Absolutely. empathetic theme. That's what which you're is here a, for. Which is a really good one, um, because the interesting part about uh, William Cooper and his petition back in 1938, William Cooper petitioned the king twice. The petition, the first petition that he gathered were signatories from Aboriginal people all around Victoria, Northern New South, uh, Southern New South Wales, etc., to petition the king around representation in the parliament. The second petition that he then gathered signatories all around Mc, Mc, Victoria and Melbourne was petitioning the king in relation to the treatment of the Jewish people based on what we were hearing and seeing from the World War. And he petitioned the king about resettlement and setting up resettlement programs for Jewish people in Melbourne. Now, you can only look at now, history tells you what that created. From the Jewish community in, in Victoria and in Melbourne, William Cooper is an absolute hero. That was the only petition that actually went to the king. So his first petition for representation for Aboriginal Islander people did not pass the governor. The Victorian governor didn't hand it on and didn't send it to the king. So it shows you then some of the oppression, but it also shows you the empathy in Aboriginal Islander people that Aboriginal people were going through a whole range of things themselves, but they were still looking at things that were happening around the world and thinking, okay, how can we help? Mm. And speaking of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 80% of us have indicated that we are voting yes. We still have a small number of Indigenous people who are concerned um, and some who are saying they are voting no. So Erin, why do you think this is the case 
Um, and what would you like people to take away from um, the, the understanding around around what, what the No campaign particularly are saying, particularly Indigenous people? Because people are asking, you know, why are there Indigenous people that are saying no? Um, I think to start with, I think you would have to think it was a bit of a conspiracy if we all, like, landslide said yes. It's probably, you know, safe to know that there's still people out there that have you know, difference of opinions and everything. Um, yeah, you just have to come to an Indigenous dinner. <laughs> we, we don't agree really on anything. We do know how to disagree. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think it's, um, I guess if you talk to the people out of that small gap that are saying no, I don't think they're all saying no to, like some people, say for example, some people are saying like, yes, cool, let's have a voice, but there should be a treaty first. So there's that, there's those people in the no camp because they think that there should be a treaty first. Um, there are people who believe that they're going to lose their sovereignty and that, you know, will be brought into, you know, this constitution and be, then lose something so, you know, so significant like sovereignty. Um, then you have, I guess, you've got to look at our history. You've got a government that has made, constantly made bad decisions and bad judgments about us and now we're supposed to trust, I guess, that this is going to be a good move for us. So I guess you can understand why people, you know, people, especially some people who have experienced some really significant traumas, like, you know, having children removed and um, I don't know, all of the other stats. There's uh, there's a plenty of reasons to have trauma and mistrust in the government. So, you know, I think they're not, it's not that they're necessarily all saying no, all of it, like just the landslide no, they're saying no because they either have concerns, um, mistrust, or they want something first, or even just that they think that this is not enough. Like, again, we're going to be giving advice, possibly giving advice to the government. There's still the risk that the government won't listen to us. And there's a lot of people out there who are kind of sick of not being listened to. So they're saying at this point, with all of the evidence that we have of our history, we should be able to have some sort of veto power to be like, no, that law is not going to pass. But we're not getting that. So like Shireen said, it's a very modest request that we're asking for, but in some people's case, it's not enough. So it's yeah, not that it's everyone saying no because it's just no. I think there's grey areas of the yes and the no. Mm. And what about you, Selwyn? Like I know that within our own community, um, and we work fairly closely together, there are people within our own community who are, who, who are sceptical in small numbers, but they exist and people are asking why. So what do you have to say to that? Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting to hear the debate about why people are voting no, and particularly our own mob voting, voting no. <clears throat> As I said, you know, more than 80% are sitting in the yes camp, more than 80% of our mob want this to happen. The arguments that do come out fairly regularly from our own mob that are saying no actually speak to why we need a voice because they always talk about things that are happening in local communities and why we're not hearing local voices to improve things like domestic violence rates, to improve things like housing, education. The, the conversation lends itself to actually having a voice. And, and this is the important element in us telling the story about why we need a voice. A, a national voice doesn't exist without the local story anyway. So you can't have a national construct with actually how, with, without being able to connect to local stories. We've got to amplify local stories at a national level through a national voice. Um, so that's the whole that's the whole dynamic. The other the other important part to remember is that we had the Uluru statement read out in the video a little bit earlier. The Uluru statement calls for three things: it is voice, it is treaty, and it is and it is truth telling. And it's really about the, and the other argument that comes up quite often is just about the sequencing. That a lot of our mob are saying, well, we we need to have treaty first. Treaty needs to come first. And we often hear lots of our own mob talking about treaty coming first. Treaty is already happening. The funny part is treaties are already happening. Queensland's already on the well down the path of negotiating and having conversations about treaty. Victoria's started the process as well. They're actually ahead of us. South Australia are having the similar conversations. Northern Territory are having similar conversations. So it's not about stopping all of those things and preventing all those things from occurring. The conversation about having this Makarata Commission, which is enshrined in the Uluru Statement, the conversation about the Makarata Commission is actually being able to say well, what does consistency of application of treaty conversations look like across the country? Because we haven't got that, but if we actually had something that then provided advice to governments and to, to others around the place about the application of treaty, 
then you might get some consistency in what's going on. Interesting, though, that there is the, one of the biggest treaties already exists in Perth. Um, the Wajak Noongar people negotiated a treaty settlement and it's worth something like $2 billion that's been there for a couple of years now. So treaties already exist, agreements already exist. It's just a matter of saying through the whole voice process at a national level, we think we might need to provide some advice around what the consistency of this stuff looks like. So um, I just want to encourage you, if you're here, uh, there is some information out the front, um, uh, an information booklet about recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people through a voice and the voice partnership empowerment explained. Um, online there will be a, uh, a link that will be provided in the chat that you can also um, jump onto to have a look. Um, but I now want to open it up to the floor. I can see that there are uh, a few people with um, with inquisitive eyes. I hope that there have been some inquisitive eyes. <laughs> yes, I can see them. This lady in the green shirt, maybe. <laughs> um, but we've got Walters there with the microphone. So also online, we're, we encourage you to pop your questions down if you've got any. Um, just raise your hand. Oh, here we go. Right up the front here, Walter. Just up here. Yeah. Just let us know what your name is and where you're from, maybe. Hi, I'm Sarah, just from QUT. Um, going back to your referendum, the three points. The first one was there is going to be the appointment of a new body and it will be the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island voice. Can you just explain who is nominated? How are people appointed? Um, is it a regular, will it be an election for the voice? Like what, how, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, great question. So I just remind, can we put the um, drafting back up again if possible? So I just want to, I would direct you again to clause three, right? So if all the questions about how will the members of the voice be chosen, um, how will it be connected to local communities, etc. All those questions of design detail need to be answered by Parliament through the legislation. So if we vote yes to this, then there'll be a process that Parliament will go through, the ordinary legislative process, where they will have to consult with Indigenous communities. And a lot of work has been done in the past, so we're not starting from a blank slate, right? And um, then they will enact legislation. And as I said, um, all members of Parliament will get a say in that, and Australians through committee, parliamentary committee processes, et cetera, will also be able to have a say in what the legislation setting up the voice looks like. Um, having said, so it is up to parliament. I want you to understand that. Having said that, the government has set out some design principles. If you go to the next slide, um, if you click forward, I'll show you what they are. Yep. So the government has set out these nine design principles that give us an idea of what they intend right? But it's only what they intend because it has to get through Parliament, if that makes sense. So Peter Dutton and the Liberals might want to change some of these design principles. That's open to them to do that. It's the parliamentary process, right? They'll all get a say. But what we know is the intention is that it will be chosen by local Indigenous communities. So like Selwyn's saying, it's really, really important that the national voice is connected to the local and the regional voices, right? And that's a key design principle uh, principle to there, right? That the voice, members of the voice will be chosen by Indigenous people and chosen by local Indigenous communities. So it's got to be anchored in the grassroots. And there's also an intention there in number three that um, they'll be representative of Indigenous communities with a gender balance and youth representation. So these are the intentions of government, but Parliament's got to enact legislation setting out all these details and future parliaments can change it. And very importantly, we're not voting on this, right, because, we're, because it's up to parliament. We're voting on, should there be recognition in the constitution through a voice, yes or no? And parliament will only get to legislate and determine all these details if we vote yes. So, and do you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, really quickly, the design principles came from the referendum working group. So as a collective, we sat around the table with government to come up with these. So yes, they've been signed off by the Minister and by the Attorney General, but they came from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people sitting in the room with 
the minister and the attorney general to say these are the things that we think should form the design principles. So when it gets to the point, because what we needed to have is a set of design principles to, to be able to talk to in the public domain when people ask the questions about, okay, well, what does the detail look like and how's it going to work, et cetera, et cetera, we can at least say, look, we don't know yet. Uh, that's kind of come in the legislation, but the design principles for the legislation should be based on these things because that's the conversation we've had with government to provide advice that that's what it needs to look like. These design principles, the other piece of the puzzle, particularly in terms of the legislation itself, is actually the consultation process of legislation. So what we have asked with the design principles is to ensure that when the legislation is drafted, there is a consult long consultation process in Aboriginal Islander communities all across the country to ensure that, yes, it's decided by the parliament um, and they will give the official tick at the end of the day to pass the legislation for it to be formed, but in consultation about what it all looks like, we need to go out and talk to mob right across the country to make sure that these things are reflected in what the legislation looks like as well. We've got a little bit of time left and I would really love to uh, see if anyone else has got questions. Um, the lady up the back, just let us know what your name is um, and where you're from. Um, you've got a microphone there. I'm Margaret. Hi, Margaret. There's already 11 members and senators elected in parliament now and we are a multicultural country and the constitution uh, represents all Australians from no matter where they're from and I'm wondering if we um, if we need a voice to parli parliament for each race that lives in Australia. Shireen, would you like to? Yeah, sure. So I want to be, thank you for asking that. Um, a Greek Australian parliamentarian doesn't represent all Greek Australians because they weren't voted in by all Greek Australians. An Indian Australian parliamentarian doesn't represent all Indian Australians because they weren't voted in by all Indian Australians. Similarly, an Indigenous Australian parliamentarian doesn't represent all Indigenous Australians in this country because they weren't voted in by all Indigenous Australians. Any member of parliament, Indigenous or non-Indigenous or whatever their ethnicity, have to represent all Australians in their electorate and their political party, right? So Senator Patrick Dodson, he doesn't represent all Indigenous Australians, he represents Australians in Western Australia and the Labor Party. Right? That's how our democratic system works. So um, this Indigenous voice will be of great benefit to both Indigenous and non-Indigenous politicians, in my view, um, because they are making Indigenous-specific laws and policies. They're making changes to the Native Title Act, for example. They're making closing the gap policies. And I'll give you a very recent example. Even though there were 11 Indigenous politicians in Parliament, when the Indigenous communities of the Northern Territory were pleading with government not to wind back alcohol management plans because harm would ensue, they were saying it over and over again. And even though there were 11 Indigenous politicians in Parliament, government scrapped the alcohol bans and a lot of harm did ensue. Those communities were not heard. Their voices were not listened to. And then government had to scramble to put the bans back in place. And a lot of harm was done and a lot of money was wasted. If there had been a constitutionally guaranteed ability for those communities to be heard in that decision, that harm could have been avoided. Um, so I, I think the Indigenous politicians will benefit from hearing advice from local Indigenous communities in making those decisions just as much as the non-Indigenous politicians. Um, the last thing I'll say is, no, not every ethnic group needs a voice. There was only one group that was dispossessed in this country. It's Indigenous people, not Indian people. There was only one group that was explicitly excluded from the Constitution of 1901. Indigenous people, not Chinese people or Greek people, only Indigenous people. And there's only one group for whom Parliament makes special laws and policies to address that history, the Native Title Act, 
closing the gap policies, Indigenous heritage protection policies. There's no Native Title Act for Indians because Indians were not dispossessed in this country. So Indigenous people occupy a special position here because they have lived here for over 65,000 years. They're the only group that has that history. And all this is saying is that we should recognise that fact and that when parliament and government make those special laws and policies about those communities, those communities should at least have a fair say so that better outcomes can be achieved. So on. So on, did you... It, look, just to build on that, there is an existing clause in the Constitution that enables the Australian Parliament to develop legislation based on race. The only people that that power has been used for is for Aboriginal and Torres people. Yet Aboriginal and Torres people aren't sitting at the table and aren't part of the policy and legislative development process to inform what that looks like. And that has been used for good because uh, that was inserted in 1967. It was the citizenship piece in 67 as well as the legislative piece so that Commonwealth could legislate for Aboriginal and Torres people. But the only time, and since then, and that was part of the part of the race provision. That race provision exists, and the only time it's only people it's been used for is Aboriginal and people. So this is really about saying, yes, we know you got the power in the constitution, but how about you actually have those people sitting at the table to inform what that what that legislation looks like? Um, we've got a question just here up the front. I do want to hear from Erin on that one, just really quickly, and then we will swing to this question. Um, I'd probably only just say like the parliamentarians that we do have in at the moment, they're only there for a term that they're elected. So when we're talking about the voice, the biggest issue we're facing is that we've had, Shireen, you're probably going to have to help me with the number of bodies. I think like in my lifetime, I think there's been seven. Like so we've had all these, even like you think of the money that goes into setting up these structures, even the energy from our old people advocating for, you know, trying to have some sort of body in place or some sort of you know, advisory committee that gets set up and then it gets set up and it starts to make change and people start to see a difference and then it gets cancelled and then this happens. Like this is, like I said, in my lifetime, I think there's been seven. So again, politicians are in a, their position for a certain amount of time. So that means we have hope or we make progress for a small amount of time. And then what happens with a lot of programs and stuff that gets set up for our communities is we have a lot of our community members, you know, again, like I mentioned, the trust issue with the government, so we have our community members participate in programs and, um, you know, all these sorts of organisations that get set up. And then as we've created this trust and we've started to see progress, then it's taken off us again. And then that has a really big impact in communities because they've started to have help, they've started to go somewhere, there's hope, and then it's gone. And then these people come into community and then they take the money and it's gone again. So I think the point of The Voice is to have this consistent body there so that we don't have to keep setting up bodies. We can have a structure there that gives advice and it's not taken away on a term, it's not taken away because the government's now changed and they've got a different, you know, goal or objective or whatever. And Thank you. And, and you know, I think that's an important question, Margaret, um, and to be able to really understand the necessity of something like The Voice. Um, I hope that that's answered your question, Margaret. Would you like to say anything else? Sorry, we just got to use the microphone because online. And if there are any online questions as well, please feel free to pop them in the chat, and Walters will let me know what the, what that is. There are currently a hundred and nine different government departments and bodies that are meant to help Aboriginals now and Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders now, and. If a voice is going to make a difference, why can't these people make a difference now? Why, where is all the money going? Um, I think that it's an elitist skimming the top so that the money doesn't get where it's needed. And I don't see that the voice will make any change to that at all because it'll still be in the same position. Well, 109 different bodies can't make a difference, what makes you think that one um, advice to parliament will? Can I just say, um, so when you're, you were speaking recently about the Indigenous expenditure budget, which is an interesting, um, an, an interesting segue into that. So 
when Margaret speaks about where the money is going because fairly it is expensive to send someone to prison, very expensive, um, and we continue to do it at exponential rates, right? So um, answering Margaret's question, <laughs> where is the money? No, 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 it's not all going to, it's not all going to people going to prison. That is one of the highest costs, though. the highest. There's $666 billion a year. There's a significant high cost of, of um, incarceration. So that is, that, that, that is, that consumes much of the budget. Um, there are also other things like health expenditure, education expenditure. But what's, what's not seen in many of those statistics, because they talk about this magical $33 billion, so this magical 33 billion about indigenous expenditure across the country, what's not seen in that magical number is then the breakdown of actually how much gets to the person, gets to an individual person. And, and much of that is wrapped up in administration and much of the administration sits within government departments. If I give you a good example of health expenditure, health expenditure over the last five years, there's been about 200 million that's been targeted towards indigenous health in the last five years. Now, when you do an analysis of that 200 million, only about 13% actually goes to community-controlled organisations. So when you're talking about community-controlled organisations, they're like the Brisbane Aches, the Aboriginal Medical Service sitting over at Woolloongabba, which actually is governed by the Aboriginal community, has input from the community in relation to the way that they run services. Majority of that, so when you think about it, 87% are going to government agencies where they've tagged something that says indigenous health. It is not necessarily going to deliver direct delivery and direct interface with indigenous people about what, how that money's spent, about how programs are delivered, how policies are changed. 13% of 200 million in the last five years, only to community control where community has an active voice in it. And that's the point in the sense of saying, you've got these magical numbers, but then you think about how much actually gets down to what we're talking about, which is a local voice having input into how those programs and services are being delivered to them to improve the outcomes, like the Bioc example in Salisbury, and it's that much of the existing pie. So what we're saying is that the voice is actually about providing advice to government to say, well, if you've got $200 million that you're spending in Indigenous health over the next 10 years, how about you make sure that there's local voices involved in actually designing what that looks like? Erin. Um, I'd probably just say too, with the voice, you're starting at the top. So there's going to be policies and stuff revised. There's going to be advice given at the top. So if you've got a voice to parliament or government that gives advice on you know certain legislation that they want to pass, once it goes to the next level, then there's policy written. By the time it gets to community organisations or even when it's in different sections of the government, how it's going to work and how it's written and all the rules and everything are talking about something where they have no idea what the impact's going to be and it's too late down here. So when we're in these community organisations and we ha they're looking up going, we need help and we need to do this, we can't do this from down here because you've made these rules up here that have no idea what is happening down here. So the point of the voice is supposed to be, probably a good example and it might not line up with everyone, but in COVID they had medical advice straight to the top about COVID and they were talking about how that whole process was working and they actually have said because of that advisory body that sat there, they believe that they had a huge impact on saving people's lives and even having that impact to say that we've got Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities that were quickly isolated to help save our population because of how vulnerable our population is to viruses like this. Having that advice at the top meant that there was people in high level med medical positions that didn't have to worry about bureaucrats writing policy about medical that they had no idea about. And that's what this is supposed to be. We will have people with actual knowledge of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander issues giving advice at the top so that the policies will have some sort of connection to the ground. I hope that answers your question, Margaret. Um, Shireen, it, it sort of speaks to that part you were talking about earlier, which was the top-down approach and how um, the voice is aiming to take it from the other end. I do just want to uh, move to this question down the front because we have one online question. Walters, can you please read that out and then we will come to this young lady up the front straight after. I apologise. Yeah, for Shireen, uh, many young multicultural people find it hard to speak to their families and parents about 
what is happening, especially since a lot of parents and families have difficult experience in understanding of political, having, have, have different underst um, difficulties understanding political understanding based on their ho home countries. Do you have any tips or advice on how many people from young multicultural background can speak to their families and parents about the referendum? So what are the basic things that people from the young, from multicultural community can basically explain, it, explain to their families about the referendum? Yeah, thank you. What a great question and, and thanks to that person for trying. You know, it's a, it can be really tough at the best of times to, to communicate across the generational gap. Um, and then there can be, you know, cultural and linguistic challenges there as well. Um, I, there are a lot of resources that can help you. So if you go to multiculturalforvoice.org, you'll see there's translations and videos and there's a fact sheet that's been translated into a lot of different languages. But my advice would be to just keep it very simple, you know, to explain some of the basics of the history that Indigenous people have been here for over 65,000 years, um, that they've been treated quite unfairly in the past. You heard me say some of the laws and policies that have happened. And as a result, they're experiencing very, very severe disadvantage still. In fact, the gap's getting wider, not, not narrower. So our present approaches at trying to close the gap are failing. So this referendum is about recognising Indigenous people in the constitution in a practical way by giving them a voice in laws and policies made about them because Indigenous people are telling us they want to improve outcomes, right? So I would just say keep it really, really simple. And there's an FAQs fact sheet on multiculturalforvoice.org and there's copies of that little booklet out there as well that has lots of answers to very common questions. And just be patient, just talk through it. Um, and, and I think you will find that there is a lot of empathy there, like I was saying before, because so many of our families come from countries with their own colonial histories, and many of us know what it feels like to not belong, you know? And, um, th you know, we know, we know what it feels like. And I think um, at the majority, majority of Australians from migrant uh, backgrounds will, will have empathy for this and will want to um, give Indigenous people this modest thing that they're asking for, the ability to give advice in decisions made about them. Sure. Can you just give that uh, website again for the people listening? Yeah, that's multiculturalforvoice.org. Lovely. And uh, this is going to be our last Verena. question. Very, very quickly. No, I'm, I'm jumping. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I literally was like, where is that voice yeah. coming it's from? It's a voice coming from the background somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's important for people to also remember that the idea for the voice came from Aboriginal on the people. So this has come from us. This has come from conversations that happened in our communities all across the country that then led to the National Convention at Uluru. The idea has come from us. The idea hasn't come from Anthony Albanese. The idea hasn't come from Linda Burney. It hasn't come from Mark Dreyfus. It's come from Aboriginal Shonda people having conversations to work out how do we want to be best represented in the Australian Constitution. So it's important to make sure that people know that it's come from Aboriginal Shonda people. And it wasn't the elite Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people that people keep referencing. It's come from grassroots community people, people like our elders and stuff. And it was up to the communities where they met to nominate who was going to Uluru to finish the conversation. So it's, yeah. I haven't heard the elite argument yet. Oh, haven't you? No. Yeah. Um, I haven't. But it's, it's important, I think, to bring these things up because if these conversations are happening, you know, we need to be able to address them. Um, so just up the front there, can I grab your name and where you're from? Hi, sorry, I'm Evie, I'm from QT. Just a quick one. Um, you mentioned before the double majority um, needed for a referendum, obviously a majority of states, that doesn't include territories, most importantly the Northern Territory where so many Indigenous people are. Do you think it's a concern that arguably a lot of Indigenous people are being treated as I don't want to say second-class citizens, but it's the idea that their, vo their vote only counts for one part of the majority. And can you speak to that? Interesting. Yeah, Shereen, it's an, we might start with you. It's an interesting question. Um, it's because the territories didn't exist, I assume, in 1901. So when the 
people who were writing the constitution were saying, hmm, what, what rules should we put in place to figure out how future generations are going to change this? There were no territories in existence yet to put into the mix. Um, yeah, so I think it's an unintended consequence of that, but I do hear what you're saying. They do count for the national number though. So, they, so the territories, the two territories we've got, the two territories do count for the national number. So they're not going to be discounted in that sense. Um, the interesting thing is sheer population wise, we've got more people in Queensland, Aboriginal people in Queensland than there are in the Northern Territory. Um, the, it's the population density within the Northern Territory that's quite large. Up there, Abrig Aboriginal people, I think they represent about 20% of the NT population. It's not a big population in the NT anyway. Um, the other thing to, the other interesting piece that's come through uh, this whole process is conversations we've had with the Australian C Lectural Commission. So when we started the discussion about making sure that we can focus on ensuring that people are on the electoral roll, when we started those conversations a couple of years ago with the AEC, the Indigenous electoral roll participation was sitting at about, I mean, close to just, just under 80%. The most recent count, because of the push, because there's a referendum coming, because people want to participate in this whole process, it's now sitting at around 93%. So that's Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people that are on the electoral roll, 93% of them who are eligible to vote um, are now on the roll. So that, to me, demonstrates that our mob are interested in this and they want to be involved in, in I guess, in the political discussion. Mm. Um, and I would probably just say, I think based on our population and our numbers, we're going to need more than the Northern Territory to vote anyway. We need actually non-Indigenous people. This is, for us to have our voice, we actually need your help and we need every, we need the 97% to come up and say that you think it's a good idea for us to be able to talk about issues that affect us. So. You know, and, and I think we spoke about history and we spoke about percentages, but when we think about Queensland and where we're sitting right now and we think about um, what the polls are saying and we look historically at the 1967 referendum, Queensland actually voted no alongside Western Australia and that's where it's looking to be headed now. Does that worry you, Selwyn? Look, it, it does worry me because I, I live here. This is, this is my home and you want to have pride in in where you are in your state and you want to have you want to you would like to think that queenslanders um want to get this across the line as well so you you certainly are i guess you're doing everything you can to make sure you're educating people around what's what's going on across the country um but it it, it is a worrying trend it's a trend that's sort of matching what happened in 1967 um but i guess it's doing things like this just having convers regular conversations with people all across the state to get, I guess, the, the mass numbers and ensure that people are aware of what's going on and we can get, I guess, a successful outcome on October 14. 31 days away. Erin, if it's a no on October the oh, 15th? If it's a no, look, it's going to be really disappointing. I think it's going to be heartbreaking, in fact. I don't, know, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to Queensland about reconciling it when it's going to be a very loud and clear message that they don't want to hear from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They they don't care what our voice has to say about issues that affect us. Like there's, I think, I think the thing that bothers me the most is that there's this ridiculous stuff about, I don't know, I've heard things about submarines and, you know, we're going to take people's backyards. We don't care about submarines in people's backyards. We want to keep our kids alive. We want to live to the same age as non-Indigenous people. Like, we've got bigger fish to fry. And, and the other, I guess, good sign, Karina, in that sense, is that the enrolment trends where we've seen significant numbers, we've seen our own mob get on the electoral roll, young people. There's been a massive amount of young people that have got on the electoral roll. Um, so we are seeing those trends. We've seen in terms, in terms of population that are getting behind the voice and supporting it. It is, the, it is the multicultural community that's getting behind the voice and supporting it. So we have these green shoots all over the place where I'm hopeful and confident that you're going to get young people across to help us get across the line and we're going to get the multicultural community to help us get across the line. And I'm about to go to oh. a young person just here in the front, Erin. I was only going to say, I think it's, I'm more sad for the young people because when this decision goes no, it's the young people who are going to have to wear the, con the consequences of it. And it's also, I think, a big slamming the door in the face of our elders that have come before us who have fought for generations to make this difference, to get here. So. And Shireen, I suppose that speaks to what you were talking about before when you said that the, the vote, the, the multicultural vote, is so incredibly crucial to this. It's crucial. And look, we've got 31 days left 
a lot can change in 31 days, um, you know, and I would just urge every one of us to, if you think that this is a fair thing that Indigenous people are asking for, and if you think they deserve to be recognised in the Constitution, and they deserve to be able to give advice on laws and policies made about them, please don't um, be passive. You know, and I, to, to multicultural communities, I would say, sometimes we can feel like um, these big nation building conversations are not for us and, you know, let's not rock the boat and let's not get involved. Um, but I want to say, no, you must get involved. Um, you must do everything you can. This is all of our constitution, you know, it belongs to all of us and changing it is the responsibility of all of us. And I would say we've, we've only got this chance. This, this, we're not going to get another chance at this. You saw how long, you know, we had to wait a long time to have a prime minister that was willing to put this question to the people because referendums are hard. So don't think that we're going to have another opportunity. Um, and I would say do everything you can, sign up to volunteer on Yes23 website, um, on multiculturalforvoice.org if you want to be an ambassador, do some door knocking and go away and think of five people that you know who you think are sitting on the fence or maybe leaning no but maybe don't have all the information and go have a conversation with them, maybe have a few conversations with them. If, we, if everyone who supported this went out and did that, the referendum would succeed. So everyone in this room has a lot of power to change the outcome of this in the next 30 days and it's the responsibility of all of us. So I would say don't leave anything undone and be creative about the ways you might help. Are you in a workplace that isn't very well informed? Is there a Zoom you can organise for your staff members or for your relatives, you know? Um, so do everything this, you can. This discussion will be recorded and we'll be able to provide that link to that um, as well. So if you'd like to share that around, um, you know, to hear even about the concerns that some people have with regards to the voice because it exists, right? Then um, share this link. Uh, there's a lady up the front. We really have to wrap it up very shortly, but I really want to hear um, uh, from you. Please tell us your name and where you're from. Hi there. Um, my name is Mavi. Um, I'm just commenting in regards to the multicultural vote. Um, so a little context of my background. Um, I'm a proud Hazara Australian. So um, the Hazara people in Afghanistan um, have been persecuted for over 200 years. We have faced genocide, um, land grabbing and land looting, unwarranted taxes. So um, we have also faced the torments of powerless um, and systemic discrimination. So from your hearts to ours, we will be voting yes and we do support this campaign. Um, my comment, uh, I'd like to respond to the comment that was made on Zoom in regards to, um, I guess, having uh, parents or um, community members, family members that are concerned. I believe that if anything, as someone from multicultural, uh, multicultural community, this, if this goes through and the vote is yes from Australia, it will impact us more in a positive way than the no vote. To see our traditional owners of the land, um, you know, to see a just, equal um, Australia for all, that will positively impact us as well. The racism, the discrimination that, that we've faced here in Australia and back home, you know, t to, I guess, eliminate that, to have, you know, a fair Australia where everyone is equal, where everyone is heard, because right now it's not equal and it's not just, and it's important that we hear our Indigenous people because, you know, not all races, not all cultures in Australia need a voice. Um, you know, and this is coming from someone uh, f um, that comes from a background where my voice, my people's voice haven't been heard, heard in Afghanistan. And for that reason, my parents migrated here over two decades ago and Australia has given us a voice. And it's important that our traditional owners have that voice as well. Thank you, I can absolutely hear the passion in your voice. Um, I would like to give a huge thank you to Shireen Morris, Selwyn Button and Aaron Lang.
It has been an absolutely fascinating conversation, very robust and thorough. Actually, probably one of my favourites, to be honest. I know I said that yesterday, but how good was this? But, um, but I want to finish up by saying, you know, regardless, I, I don't put my vote out there and, I, and, and this is not me being part of this panel does not speak to how what I believe and what I will vote at all. But what I want to follow on to say from that is it's actually not about me. I'm 3% of the population. This is about non-Indigenous Australians. 97% of this population is going to make this decision for me and for my family um, and for my community. So when you make that decision, if you are comfortable saying no, you don't think that we deserve to have that voice to give to Parliament, then vote no. If you believe that we, on the other hand, should have a voice and that we should be able to contribute to Parliament, then vote yes. It doesn't matter what I'm voting for, right? This is about holding a mirror up to ourselves and asking ourselves, where do black fellas sit in the, in the grand scheme of things for me as an Australian citizen? That's what this is asking. So I appreciate everyone coming on, everyone online, um, and I, and um, also I really just want to um, say a really big thank you to Angela Leach Barney who um, made this happen um, and, and um, I hope in the future that we'll be able to do these things again and particularly to Walters as well who has brought this together. Your passion and your, um, your drive to bring this together has been um, incredible. So please join me in giving everyone a round of applause. Thank you. And you can enjoy some food over there. And I just realised I forgot to do housekeeping at the beginning. So if you need to go to the toilet, it's down on level nine. <laughs> and if, yeah. Or, or just hold it. Oh. Oh, and I probably should mention that, and I should have mentioned this right at the beginning, but Craig Foster, you might have been like, wow, Craig's changed a lot. Craig actually had to pull out from an unexpected and very, um, I was like, oh, very last minute, um, not a, he was unable to attend um, due to a completely unforeseen circumstance. So uh, we do apologise if that was something, someone that you wanted to see. We did do a chat yesterday that you can get the link for as well with Craig. Um, so please uh, come up and ask us for that if you'd like that. So again, thank you. to keep on fighting so call it australia go on call it what you like i just call it how i see it and i see genocide